It is a pleasure to do the introductions tonight. Um, Bruce Bannert is a member of the research staff at JPL. He's been there for more years than he might want to count. Um, but um, I, I've known Bruce for somewhere between 25 and 30 years. And for almost all of that time, he has been working on trying to get NASA to do the right thing and to send a seismometer to Mars. Actually, at one point, the audacious plan, which NASA actually said they were going to fund, was we were going to send not one or two, but 16. And there was a time in the early 1990s when we all believed that science fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, 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 and in fact, they were, they were so serious about it that they thought, well, before we commit 16 spacecraft to this, we should check out the landing system. And so they said, well, it should be the Pathfinder for checking it out. And well, before they launched Pathfinder, you'll remember the little rover that could, Sojourner, um, they actually had canceled the other 16, but that's where we got Pathfinder, and that's actually how we also got um, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers to the ground. Um, but Bruce persevered through all of that, um, and in 2012, um, he got the great good news that NASA had finally said yes to a mission called InSight. Um, and uh, he has spent the last uh, three plus years um, shepherding the spacecraft towards its assembly. He's in the final four months. Um, they are due to launch um, uh, on March the 4th from Vandenberg in California um, and arrive at Mars next September the 28th, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and so by uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas of next year, with any luck, um, we will actually be collecting data from that spacecraft and those instruments. So um, give a warm welcome to Bruce Bannard as he talks about the InSight mission and exploring the birth of rocky planets. Thank you, Walter. Whoa, that's... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as, uh, as was pre previously alluded to, um, this is a first-of-a-kind mission, and the first thing that it's going to do is actually scratch below the surface of Mars. So we've been exploring Mars now, or trying to explore Mars now, for about 55 years. Uh, the first uh, mission was launched by the, the Soviet Union back in 1960. I don't think it even got out of Earth orbit, but it was launched towards Mars in 1960, and there's been about 50 missions sent to Mars since then. That's a lot of spacecraft that's sent to Mars, but we've literally, with all those 50 missions, just barely scratched, literally just barely scratched the surface of Mars. I mean, uh, Phoenix, I think, scratched the deepest, and it was about, I don't know, 20 or 30 centimeters. Um, there have been, I mean, you can, you can quibble with that. We've, we've got gravity measurements that, that kind of sense down a little bit deeper than that. We've got radar that's gone down maybe a few kilometers. But really, in terms of, of looking at the interior of Mars, we haven't really done anything in, in, in all those, those years. And um, that's a shame, because there's a lot of Mars there to look at. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. So um, the, the, the goal of InSight is to understand the formation and evolution of terrestrial planets through investigation of the internal structure of Mars. And that does not necessarily seem like a straightforward way to get at the uh, earliest processes. And by the earliest processes, um, I'm talking about the first few tens of millions to maybe maybe up to 100 million years of a, of a planet's history. And that's, a, as uh, most of you know, that's about four and a half billion years. Uh, so it's a, the first few ticks in the clock. But uh, geophysically, just about everything interesting that happens on a planet happens in that first few tens of millions of years. And the rest of it is just the clock running down. So um, it's a little bit of a, a weird look on things, but that's the way... That's the way we do it. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do it using three methods. Uh, we're using seismology, which is really the gold standard for, for investigating the interior of any planet. We've used it on the Earth, and uh, most of what we actually know about the interior of the Earth comes from seismology. If you, you know, learn that the Earth has a core that's made out of iron, if you learn that uh, the Earth's mantle is made out of, uh, of high-density uh, minerals and it's convecting and uh, we have plate tectonics, all that comes from seismology with a, a, a little bit of help from, uh, from a few other methods. But seismology is really the, 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 the tool we use for doing uh, really precision work on the inside of a planet. We're also using precision tracking. And that's kind of an interesting method. And I'll, I'll talk about what we can get out of that um, 
uh, later on. And we're going to measure the heat flow. And the heat flow of a planet is extremely important because a planet is essentially a heat engine. You know, we don't think of it uh, that way, but it's really a heat engine, and everything that happens on the surface of a planet, or most of what happens on the surface of a planet, has to do with the workings of this heat engine. All the mountains that you see, the valleys, um, the, 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 uh, the, the oceans, the atmospheres, all that's been generated by the heat in the, in the interior seeping out, and that heat has been put there by various different methods, but... Whatever you have on, on the surface with a, a, a little bit of uh, help from the sun that, that, that lifts the, the water up so it can fall down and, and, and erode things away, just about everything else that happens on a planet happens due to the, the workings of this heat engine. And so by measuring the amount of heat coming out of the planet, that really is telling you about the vitality of this engine and, and what it's doing to the geology. So those are our, our, our three uh, uh, experiments. And, and as I put together a proposal for this mission because this mission was actually chosen in competition with a, about 30 other uh, uh, proposals at the same time by NASA. Um, one of the things that they look for in these proposals is having it very, very tightly focused on just a few things that you can do very well rather than trying to do the whole Christmas tree. And so that this, this was our focus. Only two instruments, actually, these are the two instruments, and this you get for, for quote, free from the radio system. Um, so it was very well focused, and, and, and Walter actually knows that very well because he's on the, re the review panel that, that evaluated uh, our, our mission. Thanks, Rod, uh, Walter. <laughs> so why, why do we really want to understand the interior of a planet? There's, there's lots of different reasons why this is important. Uh, first of all, it's, it is the planet. I mean, the, the surface of a planet is just, you know, the, sort of the, the, the third or fourth decimal place in terms of, of, of the amount of the planet. Most of the planet is stuff that we never can see. Even if you drill down as deep as you've ever drilled, you can only reach uh, a, about a, a tenth of a percent of, of the planet at, at best. And so the very deep interior of the planet is most of what's going on. So we, we, we really don't know anything if you don't know about the interior. And the interior, as I said, is a, is a heat engine that's driving all these uh, geological processes. Um, it uh, drives the geology in the surface. It's the source of um, most, if not all, of our atmosphere. All the, the oceans on, on, the, on the planet came from the interior at, at some point. So we think of it as being a source and a sink of these things because on Earth, at least, for plate tectonics, uh, a lot of this stuff is sucked back down into the mantle uh, because of plate tectonics and the, the uh, subduction of plates at, at the uh, convergent plate boundaries. And so we have systems of, of recycling that are going on, and all that involves uh, what's going on in the interior. It actually provides a lot of the necessary conditions for a planet to become and remain habitable. There is a, a, a strong theory, which is well accepted in, in the science community, that perhaps plate tectonics is a prerequisite for having a habitable planet in terms of recycling the carbon and in terms of, of providing uh, the environment uh, in terms of regulating uh, various uh, chemical uh, balances and things like that for making a planet habitable, at least in the, in the, in the uh, zone that the Earth is, is inhabiting. And so uh, there's a very strong link b between the processes of the interior and the habitability of the surface. And so um, you can, you can uh, thank your lucky stars that we actually have a heat engine that's still running at this point. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, the important thing for, for me is the fact that the interior retains the fingerprints of the origins of the planet. And so as the planet is formed and when it goes through these processes that I'm going to talk about in a few seconds uh, that, that set up what the planet is, a, a lot of the fingerprints for those processes are buried deep in the interior of the planet and they remain there for a long time, at least for some planets. And uh, we can go back and retrieve that information and find out what happened in those first few ticks of the clock of a planet. Okay, so turns out that all the rocky planets that we know about, uh, from, uh, from Mercury all now to Mars and including the moon, which is, we'll, we'll call it a planet, even if we won't call Pluto a planet, but let's call the moon a planet for the purposes here tonight. Uh, they all share a very similar structure, a, a basic structure. They have a crust on the outside, which is made of relatively light rocks, light light meaning not very heavy minerals. Um, there's a, a more uh, dense uh, mantle, but still made out of silicate rocks of, of uh, more dense uh, minerals, um, minerals where the, the atoms are pressed closer together and, and, and more tightly packed. And then an inner core, which is 
largely made of uh, metal such as iron and nickel, maybe molten, maybe not, maybe partly molten, maybe part solid. And so, it, and, and, and these all started from relatively the same uh, sort of feedstock in the, uh, the solar nebula. So our hypothesis is that we're working from is that all these planets, they have the same basic structure, they started from the same basic building blocks, they formed through the same basic processes, and so we can study those processes on any of these planets and get insight into the, into the formation processes of rocky planets in general, and we can even then generalize them to exoplanets that we're now starting to get more and more information on in terms of, of their sizes, compositions, temperatures, etc. So why go to Mars? Uh, you would think that if you want to learn about the interior of a planet, maybe the one you're standing on might be a good place to start. And it is a good place to start, and we know a lot about uh, the Earth. We know a lot about the Earth's interior. The problem with the Earth in this particular context is that it's a little bit too active. It's, it's a very, very efficient heat engine, or effective heat engine, I should say, and it's been churning away for four and a half billion years, and it's actually sort of scrambled up a lot of the information, a lot of the evidence that, that we're looking at. There are, is, is basically no crust on the Earth that's, that's older than uh, more or less four billion years, so there's a half billion years of crust that's completely gone except for maybe a few tiny little microscopic uh, grains of zircon that, that uh, you, can, you can dig out of some rocks in, in Australia. Um, and all that, the, the, the crust uh, since then has been you know, sucked back up in the mantle, and we've got new crust, and we've got lots of lovely crust lying around on the, on the surface of the Earth, but none of it's very old, and so it really doesn't have any information about the early processes. And even the mantle's been pretty well stirred up by convection, and so you've got mixing of the mantle, and you don't really have the, those, those fingerprints that I'm, I'm talking about. The core is an exception. The core probably does have... Uh, 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 some of the information that, that, that we're interested in, but it's a long ways away. It's a, it's, it's a long hike down to the core, and so um, it's, it's a little bit hard to sort of pull that out. Um, the moon is a nice place to go. It's not very far away. We've actually been there before. Mo some of you remember that. Um, <laughs> the problem with the moon is it's kind of tiny, and so if you look at the pressure and temperatures that are, that are developed in the interior of the moon and the processes that we're interested in, are very dependent on pressure and temperature. Um, you go all the way to the center of the moon, and you're at kind of pressures and temperatures that are equivalent to maybe 150 kilometers deep in the Earth. That's not very far when you've got you know 6,500 kilometers or so of of Earth underneath you, and so it really is not rep very representative of a good-sized planet like the Earth, and so we consider Mars to be kind of the Goldilocks planet in that it's large enough that we have the kinds of pressures and temperatures that are representative of a large portion of the planet, a large fraction of the planet. But it's not so, so large that it's a, a, a strong heat engine that it's been you know, churning away. It actually slowed down very early on and, and, and likely retains uh, a lot of these fingerprints. And in fact, we have evidence that it retains it because we can look at the surface of Mars and look at the number of craters on the Mars surface and we can date that surface and that dating puts us back in the kind of 4.3 billion years or so kind of time frame just by the number of craters. And that, that's about as far back as, 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 as you could go with crater counting anyway. So the crust has essentially been there and relatively un untouched as a unit. Certainly the, the surface has gotten stirred around and we've had all this kind of geology stuff going on. But a, as far as, you know, a, a thick crust on the planet, it really hasn't had much going on since that, those early stages. Um, the, the mantle, we have evidence from geochemistry of Mars rocks that we have in our lab laboratories, not because an a, a astronaut brought them back, be because Mars threw them at us. Uh, basically, you know, we, we, your, there are impacts on Mars that blew rocks off. Those mo rocks you know, got to the Earth, fell down, we picked them up and recognized them as, as Mars rocks uh, with, uh, with various methods. And we can do analysis on these rocks and we can see that these rocks, there, there are several different classes of rocks that came from what we call different reservoirs. There are places in the mantle that have not gotten mixed up in the last uh, four billion years. And so to some extent, the, the Mars mantle has not been completely mixed. And so we think that a lot of the stratification, the layering in that mantle has probably uh, been retained since very early in Mars's history.
Okay, so how do you form a terrestrial planet? We have some pretty good ideas on, on, on at least the outlines of how this works. You start with the accretion of meteoritic material, something like a C1 chondrite, uh, which is a, a, a meteorite that you can find today. Uh, the start with the a nebula of dust that's circulating around the sun. It starts to uh, agglomerate into larger and larger pieces. As it gets, as these pieces get larger, gravity starts pulling them together into bigger and bigger uh, sort of uh, protoplanets. And the interiors of these things start to heat up. They heat up for two different reasons. First of all, uh, there's uh, a naturally occurring radioactive uh, elements that are mixed in with uh, uh, rocks in the universe. And as those elements get buried, they decay, and that decay generates heat. And so you start heating up the interior uh, from that radioactive heating. Um, also, just the impact energy of things kind of hitting it, uh, agglomerating onto it. Is agglomerating? Yeah, agglomerating is a word. Agglom <laughs> agglomerating onto it. Uh, that kinetic energy gets converted into heat. That heats it up. And as it gets larger and larger, that heat gets buried on the inside and can't get out. And you start to build it up, and it starts to melt and other stuff, and you end up with the planet. Okay? So <laughs> that's the key piece, right? <laughs> stuff happens, you know, a miracle occurs, and you have a planet. Okay? And this is where insight comes in. This is the piece that we want to study because you end up from a more or less homogeneous a ball of stuff, which is all made up of, the, like I said, the C1 chondrite uh, composition with a planet made up of lots of rocks, not a single one of which you would ever uh, think was a C1 chondrite. You, you, any rock on the Earth that you pick up now, whether it's on the surface, if you could dig down in the mantle and pull something out, you'd never mistake one of those rocks for a C1 chondrite because it's not anymore. All that C1 chondritic material has been converted into something else through a process that we call differentiation. And so that's kind of a, it's kind of magic, right? You know, you, you, you put something in, you get something else out, or, or it's called cooking, too. I mean, you do the same thing in your <laughs> oven. <laughs> but uh, geologically, it's a little bit less uh, intuitive and, uh, and on how that happens. Now, we've, we've got some ideas on how that happens, and we got those ideas from the moon, primarily. We we, the, the moon is actually a very uh, interesting and useful place to study. It doesn't give us all the information we want, but it has the advantage in that it's relatively si it's a relatively simple system. And when we brought back the rocks from the moon and we interpreted the interior information that we got from seismometers and heat flow uh, experiments on the, on the moon, we were able to put together a, 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 a the basics of a story on how the, the moon was formed and then uh, uh, generalize that to other planets. And so there's something called the Lunar Magma Ocean Model. And the magma ocean is this molten ball that the, the, the planet heats up, and especially from the, the, the radioactivity that, that keeps on generating heat uh, early in the solar system. It, it can melt all or part of the planet, and you have this giant, very deep ocean of magma. Um, the first thing that happens in this, in this magma ocean is that you start condensing uh, the non-oxidized metals, things like iron. There's a lot of iron that's mixed in with uh, the solar nebula. Part of it is oxidized, which means it's combined with, with oxygen and silicon to make uh, eventually make rocks. But some of it is, uh, is, is in the reduced state. And those pieces, uh, as they start uh, condensing into little droplets, they're about twice as heavy as the molten silicate around it. And they start to fall. And as they fall, they uh, uh, condensed together into larger and larger drops. How large those drops are is a very good question. How fast they go from up in here down to the, the center is a very good question, and those are some of the, the key questions on, on, on these processes. But sort of that's the first thing that happens as this ocean starts to uh, cool is, is that the metal in here, which is not bound up uh, with, with, with oxygen and silicon, starts falling down to the center to, 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 to create this core. So that's one of the first things that happens. That happens probably in the first, I don't know, few million years, like a, a couple of million years of, 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 the, of the planet's history. Then as it gets a little bit cooler, we, you start to get crystallization of the silicate part of this magma ocean. Uh, and, and of course, you get a, what we call a quench crust on the outside, which is just sort of the solidification of whatever this magma ocean happens to be at the time. That actually doesn't last very long. 
But the interesting thing that happens is you start having crystals in this, in this melt start to form just the way that, you know, if you put a string into your super saturated uh, uh, sugar solution, as, as, as you might have done back in grade school and watch those crystals form, uh, the same sorts of things happen in this, in this ocean. And those crystals can be of a different density than the melt that they come out of. They may be of higher density, in which case they would tend to drop to the bottom and pile up down here. They may be uh, of less density, in which case they would float to the top. And what happens is that that, uh, that process goes on and you, you can grow from the top, you can grow from the bottom to eventually form a planet which is essentially solid. Now the, the, the details of this process are very difficult to model from first principles. We don't, we're, we're trying to understand the physics, but it's hard to get uh, a, a many thousand kilometer planet to stuff that into a laboratory to actually do some, some science. So we have to actually go to naturally occurring laboratories. One of the things that, that is difficult to understand is how much this stuff, this planet is being stirred up. So if these crisp, if this is a nice still planet, all the heavy stuff will, f will fall to the bottom, the light stuff will fall to the, will float to the top, and as you cool down, you'll get different things that condense out at different temperatures. So you get what we call the refractory things. They want to solidify at relatively high temperatures, and so they'll fall out very early on, and you get things that are, that are uh, more, more volatile, less refractory, and they'll stay in the melt uh, longer, and as this process goes on, the concentration of various elements changes in here, but if you're mixing it up, these things will get reabsorbed, and so there's a very, very complex physical chemical process that, that goes on here that depends on many different things, and you end up with different planets depending on the assumptions you make about those kinds of dynamics, and, and we don't really understand those, uh, but they have different end effects, and so looking at the layering that occurs here, if any, uh, the layering that occurs up here, if any, gives us clues about how this process went on. The detailed composition of these pieces here and here give us clues as to how that went on, and that's what we're looking at with, with Insight, to try to give some of these um, quantities to the people who are doing uh, mathematical and computational models of the chemistry and physics involved based on our laboratory knowledge of how these things work in small quantities and then applying it to a large planet so we understand how the planet is formed. And so the process looks like this. You have a planet. Uh, we know a little bit about Mars. We know that its mantle is uh, basically a, a olivine pyroxene garnet mix of some sort, which is silicon, oxygen, magnesium, iron, and then little bits of uh, calcium and sodium and things like that, aluminum. Uh, but we really don't know the details, and in particular the magnesium to iron ratio up here. Um, there are different, what we call phases, which are different uh, arrangements of the atoms in these molecules, depending on the pressure and the temperature and the detailed uh, 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 abundances of the various different uh, elements involved. Uh, and there are transitions as you go down in, in, and increase your pressure. There are transitions that are affected by the temperature. And so we have lots of question marks as to where the detailed transitions occur. We're pretty sure we know the basic building blocks, but we don't know how they're put together. And down here in the, in the, the core, we know that it's mostly iron. If uh, it wasn't made out of iron, Mars wouldn't be as heavy as it is, and we know how heavy Mars is because we know how fast Phobos goes around, which gives you a very good gauge actually on, on the, the mass of the planet. But we could have other things in there like nickel, which we have in the, in the Earth's mantle, but you can have uh, lighter elements like sulfur, uh, maybe even things like carbon, although we think on Mars it's probably only sulfur, and that changes the density of the core. So you, if you have pure iron, you have a very dense core. If you put in some lighter uh, elements like sulfur, it makes it a little bit uh, less dense, and we can measure that. The more interesting thing is if you put something like sulfur into an iron core that changes its melting temperature. Just like if you melt, if, if you uh, dissolve salt into, into water, you change the freezing point of, of ice. You can, you can melt your sidewalk by scattering ice on it. Well, you can melt your core by sticking some sulfur in it. And so the state of the core is a very uh, clear indicator, not just of the temperature, the state being whether it's liquid or solid, not just the temperature, but also its composition. 
And then if you have the density, that's also an indicator of the composition. And so you have all these, these things that, that, that you can push together to uh, learn more about the interior. So in terms of insight, the mission that, that, uh, that I'm working on, we're trying to learn something about Mars. Now on the Earth, we've got hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, geophysical stations that are, that are you know, probing the Earth in a lot of detail. And you, you, you may have seen uh, uh, tomographic pictures of, of the sort of 3D structure of the interior of the Earth that, that's been put together. And there's no way we're going to do anything like that with Mars. But what we can do is look at a few very key parameters, the thickness of the crust, layering in the crust, the thermal structure and stratification of the mantle, the size, density, and state of the core. These are things, a few very, what we call macroscopic measurements that we can make, fairly simple measurements. These are all measurements that were made on the Earth back in the early 20th century. I think every uh, uh, one of these red quantities was measured by about 1935 or so on the Earth. And so it's old hat on the Earth. We would like to do the same thing on Mars. And so for insight, we have a set of what we call level one requirements. And these are the things that, that I've written down on a document, given it to NASA, written, you know, signed my name to it. It says, I, I solemnly swear that I will deliver every single one of these things to NASA, to NASA scientists, not because they're just intrinsically interesting. We're doing more than just uh, mapping out basically the geography of the inside of the planet, but because these are key parameters that scientists need to constrain the models that they've, they've been developing for planetary formation and structure. So this is what InSight is going to do, and we can then put that into the models that we have that are constrained from the other side by laboratory measurements of the melting and, and uh, condensation or, or crystallization processes in various composition melts, put all that together to understand all these processes that built the planet that we're standing on. And as a bonus, we can get the rate of seismic activity and the rate of meteorite impacts as a bonus since we're measuring seism uh, uh, the seismic uh, waves. And that tells us something about the rate of, of geological activity on Mars, which is just a cool thing to know. OK, <laughs> so that's the science. We're all done with science. We can get down to the, 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 the ooh and ah stuff, the cool stuff that we're doing. So this is the, the InSight spacecraft. Um, those of you who are planetary buffs might recognize this. This looks a lot like the Phoenix spacecraft that went to Mars in 2007. And that's because we use the same blueprints. We actually saved ourselves a lot of money by borrowing the, the design of the Phoenix spacecraft um, from th that's already been built. Oh, well, it was, it was built, it was designed, it was built, it was uh, tested. It was actually tested twice. Once not so successfully, once more successfully. Um, inside joke. Uh, uh, <laughs> a, a, a spacecraft very much like this crashed on Mars in 1999, uh, the Mar Mars Polar Lander. It was turned out to be the Mars Polar Crasher. Um, and uh, it, they, they, they learned a lot of very good lessons from that, and they did some redesign on the spacecraft and then flew it successfully in 2007. And we're using the, the, the sort of the fruits of that development activity to get a spacecraft which we believe is, is uh, a a very reliable way to, to, to land on Mars, which is a tough thing to do still after all these years. But what we've done is we've changed the payload, and the payload is mostly the stuff that's sitting up here on what we call the science deck. Here's our three uh, investigations. Size, which is our seismometer. You can't actually see the seismometer because it's under what we call the WTS, the wind and thermal shield. Um, that's because a seismometer is a very sensitive device, and we want to uh, 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 shield it from the the very nasty environment on Mars, and I'll talk about that some more. This is HPQ, which stands for Heat Flow and Physical Properties Package, HPPP, or HP cubed. Uh, this is our heat flow probe, and it has this mole that, that, that uh, penetrates down below the surface of Mars about uh, 16 or 17 feet, which is a long ways. Um, and we have the, our third experiment is our, I told you we had a, a precision radio tracking these two cone-shaped things are actually uh, uh, medium gain uh, X-band antennas that communicate directly with the Earth and allow the Earth to track the spacecraft as it sits on the surface of Mars. And that's uh, our RISE experiment uh, 
stands for uh, radio science for the interior structure and radio science interior structure experiment, excuse me. And MGA stands for medium gain antennas, and that's, that's, that's these two things here. So we have th three investigations, two instruments, very simple, very straightforward. What could, what could, what could go wrong, right? Except we, we do actually have a few more things going on, sort of stealthily in the background. I, I, I suspect uh, we didn't fool anybody on the, on the review panel, but we have a lot of other stuff that, that's on the spacecraft basically to support the seismic measurements. So we, first of all, we've got this robotic arm, and the robotic arm is used to take these instruments from their parking place up here on the deck and put them on the ground, which is very important. And that arm, of course, has a grapple here to pick them up. It has a camera, which is this little box here, to um, map out this area here so that we have a good place to put it. We have another camera that's hanging underneath the deck that's a wide-angle camera that gives us another view of it. We've got a pressure sensor. We have twins, which are anemometers. They measure the wind speed and direction. We have a magnetometer. Um, and we have, uh, which you can't see in here, a radiometer. Uh, and some instrument electronics. So we have lots of things, and these, all these environmental sensors are there to support the seismometer experiment. They're things that are measuring, things that are going on in, in our environment. These things all affect our seismic measurement, and we need to be able to take those away from our measurement in order to just to measure the motion of the Earth, which is what we'd, what we'd like to do. So we actually have a lot of instruments, which we call engineering sensors, so that we don't have to uh, claim that they're instruments, and, uh, but they all will do some great science as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the seismometer. seismometer. Seismometer is a very sensitive instrument, and whenever I say that, I really feel like I'm, I'm saying one of the great understatements of all time. So just to go through a little bit. So seismometer is basically a mass that's hanging from a spring, and as you move the ground under it, the mass kind of tends to stay still. Uh, this part goes up and down, and so the spring is very soft. It allows this to stay still, and you measure the distance between the mass and the ground, which, which changes as the ground accelerates up and down. And if you go through the, the, the freshman physics, you find out for uh, oscillatory motion, you can change that, that acceleration, which is what we're, we're looking at, into a displacement uh, as a function of frequency. And for uh, one hertz, which is one cycle per second, um, you can take our requirement, which is 10 to the minus 9 meters per second squared per root hertz, um, that's the, the, the baseline uh, sensitivity of the seismometer. You can turn it into a displacement at 1 hertz, and that's about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And, and, and as, as the size PI says, he's French, he says, that's not very much. And how, how, how not very much is that? Well, that's a fraction of the radius of a hydrogen atom. Okay, this is, this is a, a, a quantum microscopic image of a hydrogen atom, which is also a very cool thing. Um, but not really related to the InSight mission, but it's a nice graphic to demonstrate the sensitivity of a seismometer. Okay, and this is not even the best seismometer around. This is kind of a, a, a really good, but not a great seismometer. Uh, the seismometer that you find in the basement of a, of a university like, uh, like Caltech or MIT is probably almost 10 times better than this. Um, and, and these are useful measurements. You would say, well, motions of smaller than an atom, that doesn't make much sense, right? Because these atoms are, are vibrating around. But actually, if you, you, you average this out over macroscopic dif dif distances of, you know, a few centimeters or, or a meter or something, these motions are actually uh, coherent, and they actually uh, mean something. If you have a, an, an earthquake in Japan, goes all the way through the Earth, comes up here in the United States, uh, we measure motions of this size, and we can actually uh, get the waveform of that that uh, a wave that's traveled all the way through the Earth, picking up information as it goes along. So a, seis a seismic wave, as it travels through the Earth, is gathering information as it goes along, sort of like a rock collector or something. And uh, very sharp scientists uh, spend a lot of their careers learning how to take those wiggles and pull that information out of that waveform. And that's, that's the magic of seismology. So. When I say it's a very sensitive instrument and we need to measure the things that are going on, you can imagine that if the temperature goes up and down by, uh, uh, say, 100 degrees as it goes from, from day to night on Mars, you can think about you know, the, the contraction. You hear your car going tick, 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 tick as it's, as it's uh, cooling down. Those are enormous uh, displacements for a seismometer, 
And so we have to, first of all, compensate the seismometer internally as much as we can. Then we insulate it, in this case, with three different layers of insulation. And then, even then, we have to measure the te temperature very, very precisely so that we can subtract the effect of it from what's left over. We have to do the same thing for wind. When the wind blows, it's, if, if the seismometer shakes a little bit, that's going to that's gonna kill us. We have to protect it from the wind and also measure the wind so that we know that if we can see wind on the, the, the uh, anemometers, we're, we can know that uh, the, the, the seismic measurements are maybe a little bit, bit hinky. We measure the magnetic field because that affects our seismic measurement. We measure the pressure because uh, when the breeze goes by, it changes the, the pressure of the atmosphere. That pressure pushes down on the ground a little bit more or a little bit less, and that shows up as a signal in our seismometer. So all these things we have to take into account as we're making this measurement because we're not making a measurement of a fraction of a hydrogen atom in a laboratory somewhere. We're doing it in the dirt on Mars, 40 million kilometers away. It's not as easy as it sounds. Okay, so... Oh, here's, here's another demonstration, okay? Th this is actually a uh, seismic information that we took at Lockheed Martin where they're building our spacecraft and, and doing a very fine job, I must say. Uh, we put a, a seismometer in one of the um, assembly facilities there where we're going to be doing our, our final testing. Uh, and this is, these are spectra, uh, seismic spectra. So this is uh, frequency from very low frequencies to high frequencies. Uh, red means there's not much going on. Blue means there's a lot of energy coming through. And this is a function of time over five days. So when you have a, a, a vertical stripe, which means you've got a lot of activity, this is a weekend. This is when people are going to work and going home, coming to work, going home, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that it gets quieter. It gets more noisy. This is actually a quake that occurred over the weekend. B but this whole blue thing through here, what is that? That's what we call the ocean microseismic band. This is basically the, the, the waves hitting the beach in California, measured in Denver. Okay, so that's how sensitive a seismometer is. You can't go anywhere on the Earth where you're not sort of swamped by the ocean noise in this band. And so that sort of sets the bottom limit. On Mars, we don't have oceans, so we actually have a nice red zone through here, which is going to actually help us out quite a bit. So this is what, a seismom what our seismometer looks like. It's a little bit more complicated than a mass on a spring. Uh, <laughs> this is the, the heart of our seismometer. We have a Here's the spring down here, this little uh, uh, leaf spring, and we have a, a, a pendulum that's actually hung upside down because that makes it more sensitive. Um, we put it in an evacuated sphere. These are the two halves of, of the sphere. There's three of them in here, so we get all three directions of motion, uh, some electronics. Um, this is the tube that we pump out the, the vacuum in here, so it's in a, in a big thermal bottle. Um, when we put it all together, we have a leveling system because it has to be leveled very accurately. You think about it, we're measuring horizontal uh, uh, accelerations. If it's off by a little bit this way, you've got gravity times a small angle, and it's going to give us a big, a big uh, force to the side. So we have to level with these legs very, very precisely, and um, the whole thing gets uh, buttoned up in, a, in a another thermos bottle out here, and then we put that wind and thermal shield over to, to, to make our, our sort of our third, uh, third line of defense against the, against the weather. Um, Martian seismology. Okay, so first of all, how do we know that we're going to actually measure anything on Mars? No one's ever seen a Mars quake, um, but we've seen lots of faults on Mars. Most of the faults are really old. Some of them are older than others. We can actually you know, measure all the faults on Mars. We can date them using mostly the density of, uh, of meteorite impact craters that, that, that overlap them. And we can extrapolate that activity, which was very l high early in Mars' history, when we see most of this faulting, all the way to the present. Um, and we can determine what we expect the activity to be today. Turns out that that number uh, comes in here. This is sort of the number of events per year uh, in this axis. And this is the size of the quake in increasing this way. You can see as you get bigger quakes, you, be you get fewer and fewer of them, which is what we see on the Earth, and so we're actually assuming this slope because it's true on the Earth. It's pretty true on the Moon. This little line here is the lunar uh, seismic activity that was measured by Apollo. This red line up here is the Earth seismic activity. If you take away all those uh, noisy plate boundaries and just look at what happens inside the plates, and what we, m what we estimate from Mars falls in between those two, which is kind of what you'd expect. And so we really, 
have a very strong expectation of seeing Mars quakes uh, on Mars, and those are going to be the source of the signals that, that put those waves through that we can analyze for interior structure. If it turns out that we have a very bad day and Mars decides to be very uh, recalcitrant, we actually have a couple of, of guaranteed signals. One is the Phobos tide. This is Phobos, which is uh, really just a glorified rock that's orbiting Mars. It's pretty small, but it's large enough that its gravity uh, will actually cause a solid tide on the surface of, of, of Mars. So just as the ocean gets pulled up and down by our, our moon, uh, turns out the surface of the Earth actually gets pulled up and down as well by close to a meter. You, I bet you didn't notice that going up and down every day, but it actually happens. On Mars, that solid tide, the, the deformation of the planet as Phobos goes overhead, is just a little bit less than a centimeter. And it turns out that's very sensitive to the size of the core because you can think if Mars was a solid ball, it's going to be harder to deform it than if it's a hollow ball because if it has a liquid core, it's basically a hollow ball and it'll deform more easily. So whether that's, you know, 0.915 centimeters or 0.9152 centimeters um, is a difference between whether that's solid or liquid. And so if we measure that displacement very precisely, we can tell not only what the size of the core is, but even what the, the, uh, the, the, the density of the core is. And so the Phobos tide actually will allow us to measure the size and the density of the Mars core, which is uh, a nice thing to do if you don't have earthquakes to tell you about it. Another thing that we have are meteorite impacts. So th these are before and after pictures from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, High Resolution Camera, high rise And um, this is actually an old picture uh, this only shows about, uh, I don't know, about uh, 80, 85 or so uh, impacts. They're up to, I think, over 200 now that they've gotten before and after pictures of uh, and, and able to, to put a pretty uh, tight balance on the meteorite impact uh, rate on Mars. Uh, that's something that we had hoped to do, but they're, they kind of beat us to it. But we'll do it, too, just to be because we can. Uh, <laughs> but every time one of these meteorites hits, it creates seismic waves. They're not usually very big because not very many uh, large Im impacts occur. Most of these are in the few meters to a few tens of meters size range. Uh, but we've done the calculations, and we should see something like 10 meteorite impacts that are visible with our seismometer over time. Uh, when we see those impacts, we should be able to be able to figure out approximately how far away they are and uh, what direction they are. We can tell MRO to go back and look for these telltale signs and figure out exactly where on the planet that occurred. And that actually gives us a lot of information about, uh, that, that allows us to pull a lot more information out of that signal. So we should have uh, signals from the meteorite impacts. And finally, um, hello, there you go. We have atmospheric excitation. So as, as I said, you know, we have pressure that's pushing up and down on the planet. Uh, we have breezes that go by that do that. We also have storm systems that, that, that bang on the planet a little bit more. And it turns out if you sit there and kind of pound away on, on, a, on a, an object like a planet or like a bell, um, it'll start to resonate. And, and, and from physics, we know that if you start pumping energy into a system, it's going to organize itself into resonances, what we call eigenfrequencies or tones. And so the precise frequencies of those tones uh, tells us something about the structure of the inside of the planet. And so... This stuff, which is sort of beating on the planet all the time, will create um, certain frequencies at which the planet is going to be resonating. We can use that to get at the planet. We may not be able to see this. It's kind of at the limit of what we think our, our resolution is, but especially if we're there for a very long time, we should be able to use uh, long periods of data to sort of pull out these, uh, these resonances. So we've got lots of ways to do it. The other thing about seismology, if you know anything about seismology at all, you know you need at least three stations to do seismology, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> so <laughs> apparently the, the director of NASA didn't know it either because he, he you know, said we could go with one. But turns out we're, we, there, there's lots of tricks that you can do. Um, normally you use three stations and you triangulate. You have the, the uh, PNS arrivals that, 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 uh, that come in to your, your station. And you can use those PNS arrivals to uh, 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 figure out how far away it is. And if you ha know how far away it is from three different places, 
you can find out where those things converge and you can locate exactly where your epicenter is. If you know what the epicenter is, where the epicenter is, you can calculate the velocity of the wave and the velocity is, is sort of the, the, the bread and butter of a seismologist because the velocity is related to the composition and the composition is, is sort of what we're after. So that's, that's you know, in, in 30 seconds, that's what a, a, a two semester course in seismology teaches you. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're using some tricks that, that we can basically only do on Mars really effectively. And that is not only are we using the P and S waves, but which go straight from the a quake, which occurs here, you go straight through the planet to your seismometer here. That gives you basically two pieces of information. You have arrival times, P arrival time, S arrival time, but you need to know four things. You need to know X, Y, Z, maybe, and T. So that's four pieces of information that you want. You have two pieces of information from P and S. That's not enough if, you, if, if you've gone through the, uh, an algebra course. So what else do we have? We also have something called surface waves, and those are waves that travel along the surface of the planet. Uh, we have the wave that goes straight from the event and comes to our seismometer. Now we have three pieces of information. We have the one that goes the long way around the planet, shows up a little bit later. Now we have four pieces of information. But just to make things even better, this one keeps on going all the way around the planet because Mars is a small planet and hits us again about 20 minutes later. And so now we have five pieces of information. We want to know four things about this event. Uh, that actually gives us extra information that we can then use to, to make our, our, uh, our inferences even stronger. And so we can do sort of uh, three station seismology with a single station. And that gives us these kinds of curves which are called travel time curves. This is distance versus time. And this is, uh, the way to read this is if you're uh, a quarter of the way around the planet, say here, and you wait, the P wave hits you, bang here, the S wave a little bit later, and then there's all these other things which are various different bounces and refracted paths through the planet, and every one of these lines tells you something about the inside of the planet. And so when you, if you put together this, this diagram from many, many different seismograms that are taken from many different events that happen at many different distances from your seismometer, this to a seismologist is the same as a map to the inside of the planet. And so this is sort of the, our holy grail. What we want to do is put together this plot for Mars. And then there's a whole bunch of, so that's arrival time analysis, which is kind of standard seismology. There's other things we can use, which mostly have to do with multiple bounces and resonances and things like that. But just suffice it to say, there's lots of different methods that have been developed on the Earth to uh, pull information out of seismic waves about the interior. They're usually used in specialized uh, situations. We've sort of cast a very wide net, gotten a lot of seismologists together to, to figure out how to use this stuff and to pull the most information out of, the, out of this, these uh, single station seismograms that we'll be collecting and make the mission worth the half billion dollars that we're going to spend on it. Okay, so we have the two other experiments. One is our heat flow measurement. This is kind of cool. It's a self-penetrating mole that, is, that hammers its way down below the, to the surface of the planet and it pulls a cable behind it, and on that cable are temperature sensors about every 20 to 35 centimeters apart, and they measure the temperature as a function of depth in the planet. So over that top five meters or so, 16 to 17 feet, we measure the, the temperature as it increases going down here, because you're 15 feet closer to the core at the bottom than you are at the top. That doesn't seem like much, but there's a fraction of a degree difference between the bottom and the top here, and that fraction of degree tells us how fast heat is coming out. And it turns out that whatever heat's coming out of this top little layer of the planet is the same amount of heat that's coming out from way down here because it has to go somewhere, right? So if we can measure the heat flowing out from this very thin part of the outside of the crust, we can then extrapolate that down to the center and understand the uh, basic uh, driving force for the heat, heat engine of the planet. So a little bit more information on how that works. Okay, here we go, bang. So this is the, the, the principle of the mole. We have a, a hammer that knocks it down. It's, it's wound up by a motor on the inside running on a cam like this. Um, this looks like it shouldn't actually work, right? Because for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. But we have different speeds because we have this thing knocking down and we have a, a spring back here that it doesn't eliminate the negative impact of repulsion, but it slows it down. 
and allows the friction on the side of the mole to absorb some of the, the rebound. And so we get a negative, uh, a negative, a net positive motion going down into the soil. And um, this all always, every time we, we put this up here, people say that can't work. So we, we've actually done this. We have a five meter high tube, which is a very tall tube, it turns out, in a, in a laboratory in Bremen. And we can put it up at the top. We fill it up with dirt. We put it up at the top. We turn it on and bang, 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 bang. In about an hour and a half, it bangs onto the bottom of, the, of, the, of this tube. So it really, really works as long as you don't run into a big rock. But we're not going to, we, we're going to land somewhere where there's no rocks. There's literally <laughs> no rocks. We, we've taken pictures of our landing area, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the landing area later. These pictures are about uh, 30 kilometers long and about a kilometer and a half wide, and we've had undergraduates working for us all summer long looking at these things with magnifying glass, and there's literally one or two boulders in this entire area that they can see. And these boulders are big boulders. They're like the size of a car, but you can extrapolate that down. There's really not very many rocks. Okay, and our third experiment, the tracking experiment, um, what we do is we measure the timing and the Doppler shift of waves that are sent from the Earth they're received by the spacecraft and turned around immediately and sent back to the Earth. And so we can do all the measurements actually here on the ground. Um, we can do that tracking and determine the location of the spacecraft to within 10 centimeters in inertial space with respect to quasars, which are basically stationary objects a long, long ways away. 10 centimeters at a distance of roughly 40,000, 40 million kilometers, which to me is magic, but th I'm assured that's not magic, it's science. Not that much different sometimes, but th this is what we do with those, those giant, you know, 35 and 70 meter dishes that, that you've uh, seen pictures of, the Deep Space Network. Uh, this is, we, we routinely do this with uh, orbiting uh, spacecraft. We measure the very small variations and accelerations on the spacecraft to map out the gravity field of planets. Um, for InSight, it's a little bit different because we're the, 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 the spacecraft isn't moving except for with the planet. So as the planet rotates, the, the spacecraft moves. And so as we track this uh, spacecraft over the course of a half hour or an hour, it traces out a little arc, and that arc can be traced back to a rotation pole the North Pole of the planet, and so we get a very accurate determination of not only the how fast Mars is rotating, which actually Mars, the, the rotation rate varies a little bit uh, due to some atmospheric phenomena and things like that, but it also changes its direction a little bit. And it changes its direction on two different time scales. First of all, it processes like a top, but a little bit more slowly. It's a big planet, so it takes 165,000 years to wobble around once. Um, but that precession uh, from physics, we know that it's related to what's called the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia has to do with how much mass is concentrated towards the center versus the edges of an object. And, and as you know, we've got a big mass down here at the center, the core, and this precession is very sensitive to the size and density of that core. And so we want to measure this precession. So all we have to do is wait for 165,000 years and measure it, and we've got it. But some of us are impatient, as scientists tend to be. So instead, we measure how far that it's moved over 20 years. So we, we measured it from Viking, uh, using the, the radio on Viking. We measured it 20 years later with uh, Mars Pathfinder. And we got our first determination of the moment of inertia. It had some fairly big error bars on it, because 20 years is not so long compared to 165,000. But we'll get another snapshot 20 years later still and basically make it twice as good, except we do a little bit better and twice as good because we have tricks now that we didn't have available then, which I don't understand because I don't do this kind of magic, I mean science. Um, but we, we actually should be able to uh, uh, decrease those error bars by about a factor of four or five and give us th this moment of inertia. Moment of inertia actually kind of mixes up the, the size and density so you can't pull them apart, which is annoying. Uh, but we can actually use these other wobbles, which are called nutations, and those happen on time scales of less than a year. They happen on half a year, a third of a year, you know, mostly fractions of a year, plus or minus a little bit, which is kind of important. 
So with two years of data, we'll actually be able to map these wobbles of the court of the, 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 the pole. And those wobbles are only a handful of meters large. So th so the pole's not wobbling by very much, but we can measure it with this, this kind of accuracy. And the size and the frequency of those wobbles is very closely related to the, 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 uh, the density of this core and the, the way it sloshes around essentially in, inside the planet. And so this is our, our, our best, basically our best uh, uh, look into the properties of that core. Okay, what is next? Oh yeah, this gives the moment of inertia, this gives us core size and density, bingo, we're golden. Okay, so the, so, uh, the, the InSight mission summary. So we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna fly a very near copy of the Phoenix lander. We're launching uh, next March 2016 from Vandenberg, California. Um, there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, it's that's 119 days, eight and a half hours from right now. A mm, little bit more, maybe maybe eight and well, never mind. Um, <laughs> so if I I I I, I have a, a countdown clock on my computer. I watch this all day long, every day. <laughs> uh, if, if you know anything about trajectories, this is actually what we call type 1 trajectory, trajectory, which means we're on the express train from Earth to Mars. We only go about halfway around the sun from, from Earth to Mars. We get there pretty quickly in less, in, well, about six months, which is about as fast as you can imagine getting to Mars. Uh, most Mars missions go in anywhere from 9 to 14 months. Um, some of them are lucky like us, they get, get a, a type 1 trajectory. This means that you've got plenty of rocket uh, under, underneath you to, to, to get you there. And that brings us to this next thing, which is Vandenberg. We're launching from California. Normally you launch from Florida and you have to deal with crocodiles. The heck with that, we got, we got something much cuter. We got, you know, sea otters. <laughs> uh, we're launching from California. And, and the int it's kind of interesting because the reason uh, we launched from Florida some of you might, might, might guess. The reason you launch from Florida is because the Earth is rotating pretty fast. And so when you launch from Florida, you launch to the east, and you actually get a slingshot effect from the Earth's rotation that, that helps you get into orbit and allows you to get into orbit with less rocket power than you would normally need. And that's the way we've, we, uh, we have uh, launched every single one of our planetary missions over the last you know, 50 years is, is from Florida using the Earth to, to help us get in, in, into orbit and out into space. Um, but because Phoenix was designed for a Delta rocket, which is a fairly small rocket, Delta rockets basically aren't being made more anymore. So we have to go on something called an Atlas, which is a bigger rocket. And so we have about twice as much throw power with an Atlas as we did with the Delta. And so instead of using the Earth to slingshot us, we're going to launch from this point here in California, which is the Vandenberg Air Force Bases, which is where all of our spy satellites are launched from. And we're going to launch almost due south into a polar orbit and just thumb our nose at the Earth's rotation, say, we don't need you in your Earth rotation. We can do it all by ourselves. And, and so that allows us to launch from Vandenberg. And people say, well, why are you launching from Vandenberg? And I usually say, because we can, because <laughs> it's cool. But the actual reason is that there's a, a, a traffic jam at, uh, at Cape Canaveral during our launch period. There's, there's uh, three other missions that are trying to launch. There's only two pads, and so this actually allows NASA to, to save, you know, uh, uh, five or ten million dollars in in, in uh, pad refurbishment and, and overtime, and it allows us to, to to drive up from Pasadena instead of having to get on a plane. So it's just it's just fun. Okay, so we uh, launched in in uh, March fourth. We have a, a actually this is now to to uh, March twenty eighth. We've extended our, our window. It's another thing you can do with a big rocket. Uh, so we have about f almost four weeks that we can launch. Um, whenever we launch, we land on September 28th. We've got a, a, an orbit design that gets us to, Mar to Mars at the same date, no matter when we launch. After that, we have about two months to deploy our instruments. Uh, once we're on the ground, we are going to uh, take our measurements for two years, which is one Mars year. That takes us through the winter, takes us through the summer, and then that's the end of our mission. Not, not, I hope. Um, the reason why we do this is, first of all, Given the seismic activity we expect on Mars, two years is about how long you need to guarantee that you have enough large enough quakes to be able to do the analysis analyses that we need. But there's a sort of an ulterior motive to this, which is if you design a spacecraft to last an entire year on Mars, there's nothing to tell you that you can't keep on going 
if you can just get a little bit of pocket change from NASA to keep your operations going. And so we may be able to extend this mission to uh, several other, several more years uh, and, and uh, accumulate more data to, to get uh, more uh, precise science results. So our nominal end of mission is October 6, 2018. Um, we're going to be at NASA's door with our hat in our hand on October 5th asking for more money, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so some, some cool pictures. This is our spacecraft. This is the, the InSight spacecraft all buttoned up and ready to, uh, ready to fly. This is the back shell being, being uh, uh, lowered onto it. Um, when we have it all buttoned up, ready for, for flight, it's in this configuration, which we call our cruise configuration. We have our aero shell up here. We have solar panels uh, that uh, give us power on our way to Mars. Uh, the uh, reaction control engines that, that keep us pointing in the right direction are poking out here. And this is what it looks like on the, on the ground. The nice, beautiful solar panels all unfolded. This is our science deck. The seismometer is this orange thing here. This is our windshield. You can't really see the HPQ because it's stealth. It's black, but it's sitting right there. Uh, and this was taken about uh, three months ago in, in, in Denver. The spacecraft has essentially complete, been completely built for about three or four months now. Um, and we've been spending the, all that time doing tests because what you do on a spacecraft is you build it and then you test it and test it and test it and test it and test it so that you've gone through every configuration that you can think of, every uh, possibility that you can think of to make sure that this very, very complicated system is going to work the way you think it's going to work, the way you want it to work on Mars. Uh, and, this is, and this is the, the spacecraft being lowered into the thermal vacuum chamber. This is actually a thermal vacuum chamber that has the capability of, of, of of uh, supplying solar illumination. So we put it down in here, we unfurl the solar panels, or actually only one solar panel because there's not quite enough room, and put a, a lid on it, pump it down, fill it up with CO2 to Mars pressure, uh, uh, get it really nice and cold like Mars, and put it through its complete paces for about a week and a half in its configuration on Mars. So that's, that was a lot of fun. Um, this is a uh, a uh, video showing our EDL. Actually, it's showing the Phoenix EDL because we haven't paid for our own animation yet. But <laughs> this is how we go in. Uh, we first we have an aero shell which scrubs off a lot of our uh, of our velocity as we go into the atmosphere. Uh, when we get about to Mach two, we pop a chute that slows us down quite a bit. Um, we're still going at about 300 kilometers per hour at this point because Mars's atmosphere is not very thick. At some point, we drop the aero shell, we pop down our legs, and then we have a, a clear view of the surface. We have a landing radar, which uh, tracks our altitude till we're about a mile up, and we drop off. We fire our rocket engines here, and we land. No airbags, no bouncing beach balls, no sky cranes. We land on Mars the way God intended. <laughs> <laughs> on honest-to-gosh rockets. <laughs> um, <laughs> Any of you science fiction buffs from the 60s and 70s know what I'm talking about. When we're on the surface, we unfurl our solar panels, and then we're ready to go. And at this point, we have to stop the animation because the rest of the stuff that happens is all Phoenix stuff. But we will get our own animation pretty soon. Um, our landing site, uh, Phoenix landed at the north, very near the North Pole. Uh, it was looking for ice below the surface. Uh, we're not looking for ice. We're looking for a nice, safe place to land. Uh, we don't care about geology. We don't care about rocks. In fact, we hate rocks. Uh, so we're landing near the equator to give us lots of solar energy. We're landing in the flattest, safest, most boring place on Mars, except possibly Meridiani Planum. Uh, it turns out this is the area that we're landing in. It's called uh, Western Meridiani Planum. It's about 300 kilometers north of Curiosity. Curiosity is here. Spirit's just down here. The, the remains of Beagle are over here somewhere. Viking 2 landed up here. This is a, a crowded part of Mars. So we initially looked at uh, quite a few landing ellipses. These are sort of the, the dispersion of areas that, that we would land in uh, based on variations in the atmosphere and stuff. Uh, we recently narrowed it down to just a one small region here. And in fact, these, this is our landing ellipse. Uh, this is about 120 kilometers long by about 25 kilometers wide. And the orientation of this ellipse changed a little bit from the opening of our launch window to the middle to the close of our launch window. Um, you can see there's craters around here but there's not many craters in here. There's not many rocks. There's not much of anything in here, and it's going to be a very nice, safe, boring place to land. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about here is deployment. We've actually sent seismometers to Mars before. 
we, on, on the Viking missions. Uh, one of them failed. Uh, it had a mechanical problem. The other one on Viking, this is actually the Viking 1 uh, seismometer. This is the one that, that failed. Viking 2 actually operated. But, so this is the seismometer on the Viking spacecraft taken with the, the, uh, the, the, the camera here. This is the ground. So what's wrong with this picture? Okay, so we're trying to measure very small displacements of this thing here. Instead, we're sitting on top of the spacecraft, which has shock absorbers on it. Shock absorbers. So it turns out the, the seismometer was the last instrument that kind of got snuck onto the payload of Viking. Viking was a biology mission. It almost got tossed off three or four times, but it sort of last in line for all the resources. And so it turned out that this seismometer did not measure any Mars quakes, and when we go back and calculate it, it had about a 20% chance of doing that, and we just didn't get lucky. So you've traveled 650 million kilometers to get to Mars, but you're still one meter short. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my brilliant insight was why don't we put the ground and the seismometer in exactly the same place? And we do that with our robotic arm. So this is the process that we go through. We have the arm, has a grapple, it reaches down, picks up the seismometer. We have some explosive bolts that, that dis uh, uh, disengage it from the, the, the deck here. We come around here and we put it down on the surface. We have a camera here, which has already mapped out the best place on the ground to put it. Uh, we put it down, we pause for a minute, we, g we back off, and then we take pictures of it to make sure everything is fine. Uh, this cable is connecting us to the spacecraft. It provides the power and the data lines coming back. Uh, we have this extra stuff inside here. We drop it to sort of make this cable nice and slack. And once we've done that, we go back with our arm. Go back with the arm. There we go. Uh, we go back. We pick up our wind and thermal shield, this, this uh, walk that's on the, 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 the spacecraft. The, the, it's about this big around, a little bit less than a meter. That whole seismometer is only about this big. Uh, that's the that's the 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 most dense densely packed money that I've ever seen. This is about eighty million dollars right here. So and it, this has a, a skirt underneath it, which has four layers, including some chain mail at the bottom, which uh, accommodates itself to the ground and actually seals around the bottom here, so the wind doesn't get underneath. And this has been aerodynamically designed uh, using. Uh, 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 hydrodynamic flow uh, theory to make sure that this actually produces negative lift when the when the wind blows on it. So when the wind blows across, instead of cartwheeling across the surface like a tumbleweed, it actually hunkers down a little bit harder on top of the seismometer. Again, that's the se theory. I sounds like magic, but next we go back, we pick up our heat flow probe and uh, and put it down on the ground because the engineers said we couldn't penetrate through the spacecraft to get down to the ground. And and once there, the uh, the mole is in this little chimney part here. We release it, and it starts on its journey down to the, to the bottom. So this whole thing takes about two months. A little bit speeded up here. <laughs> <laughs> the actual placement occurs all in one, t one, one go. It takes about a minute and a half for each of these, these deployments. But the way we do this on Mars is you put the thing just next to the seismometer. You take a picture of it, send a picture of the Earth, look at it, say, that's OK. And the, the, the next day, you send the, the signal back, says, go down and pick it up or grab it. You grab it. You take a picture. Did it grab it? Okay. Send it back down to Earth. So you go back and forth. So this, it takes about two weeks just to put the first seismometer down, another week to get the, the, the walk on top of it, and then another week to get this guy down. And in between, we do all kinds of things. So it actually takes two months to put the whole thing down. Actually, it takes about about a month and a little bit, and then we have a month for all the time that we're going to deal with things that you never expected on Mars. Okay, so that's about all I have to talk about. This is a, a spirit image from Gusev Crater. This little dot up here, that's the Earth. And I think this is very emblematic of our, of our motto where we're gaining insight in the Earth by going to Mars. So thank you very much. Okay, we'll uh, take some questions. I got a little, <laughs> a little quick thing to say. Uh, talk about the Phoenix mission. When the Phoenix PI was asked why Phoenix was using, not using airbags, he would say, because they're clumsy and embarrassing, and it's not going to intimidate the Martians when you land that <laughs> way. <laughs> but then he went into the real reasons why. So. 
Peter's a funny guy. All right, uh, we'll start right here. Does the activity of the mole pro uh, pose any threat to that delicate seismometer right next to it? Why wouldn't you dig the mole first and then put the seismometer down? Um, the, 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 the mole doesn't, doesn't actually threaten the seismometer. The seismometer, actually the, the reason why the thing costs $80 million and not $10,000 is because it has to survive launch, it has to survive landing, it gets hammered and hammered, and so we have this very sensitive instrument that has to survive uh, uh, in a very uh, harsh environment both on Mars and getting to Mars. And so we've the, the designing a seismometer that can take those kinds of, that kind of abuse and still make those measurements was, was very challenging. And so the mole, it's a few meters away and it hammers and it shakes us, but that's actually we're gonna be using that. When the mole you know, hits it, it sends some seismic waves through the ground and we're gonna try to use that to map out any layering in the upper uh, few tens of meters of the, the Martian soil. We think about 10 meters down, we'll start getting into some bedrock, and so we'll be looking for, for reflections off of that. And so, yeah, the, the, the shaking from the mole is actually very benign compared to sticking it on an atlas and <laughs> punching it into space, so. Yeah, I have a question. I'm just curious, uh, do you guys have any plans to establish uh, communication with the Curiosity rover? Because since it's like 300 some kilometers away, and to c provide any kind of kind of assistance or vice versa, yeah. um, probably not. I mean, if you think about, you know, Opportunity has been on Mars for 10 years, and it's gone uh, something like 27 or 28 kilometers. So, in 100 years, maybe we could get there. But uh, it, it 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 it's actually slow going on Mars. So so it's not likely that that Curiosity would ever make it as far. And besides, it would get out of the interesting geology and have to, it, you know, it's, it's like you know driving you know across west texas it's like you know forever to get anywhere <laughs> and nothing happens um i've done it uh, <laughs> uh but wha what we actually do plan to do is is uh especially for the uh meteorological experiments um curiosity is relatively close and so we can actually do some some joint measurements of uh, weather fronts as they go across and look at the some some variations in, in the communication actually uh, insight and, and, and curiosity can see MRO at the same time and we'll be able to, to use that correspondence to do some science but as, as far as you know direct communication that's not going to happen Um, radiation, of course, in space is always a, an issue, but it turns out that about 90 some percent, 99 percent of the radiation dose that you get on the, 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 the journey from Earth to Mars happens in the first half day or so as you're going through the Van Allen belts because the, 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 the Earth's magnetic field actually traps a lot of the solar wind into these radiation belts and it's very intense. Uh, and so as you're going through those belts, you pick up a pretty big dose, so you go through pretty quickly. And when you get out into space, it's not so bad, except for a few solar flare events. And even those aren't as intense as the radiation belts. And so, and, and all that's been taken into account in the, the kind of electronics that we use. It's, it's radiation resistant. And, and once we're on the surface, it's even, well, in, in, in terms of, of, of solar radiation, we're we're shielded by the atmosphere a little bit, by the magnetic field of the Mars a little bit. In terms of cosmic rays, we actually have a little bit more exposure because they hit the ground and they produce more radiation, but all that's been taken into account and it's not too bad for a spacecraft, not great for a person, but. Not really, I don't, I, I'm not, not an expert on that. I, it's, it's, it's not. It's it's probably no worse than an airline pilot that actually gets quite a bit of radiation uh, going high in the Earth's atmosphere. But I I don't really I, I mean I've heard that somewhere, but I, I'm not an expert. Okay, first an assumption. Uh, I'm assuming you have more or less as many minerals on Mars as you do on Earth, more or less. And so in your diagrams, you, you focused on olivine and pyroxene, I think it was. Why do we focus on those two? You, you mentioned those two as opposed to all the stuff that might be there. Um, 
A couple of reasons. First of all, we actually, ha as, as I said, we actually have samples of Mars now that are in our, in our laboratories. Some of them might be in this very building for all I know. Um, that show us that these rocks are, are similar to Earth rocks. They're not identical. Um, it's, it's really the in, in, in the details of the, the detailed geochemistry, like I said, the, 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 the ratio of, of magnesium to iron, for example. In, in those rocks, a lot of the places where you have an iron atom and a magnesium iron atom are roughly, have roughly the same size, a little bit different size, roughly the same electron properties. And so you can, you can substitute them and they make slightly different chemical uh, combinations, slightly different uh, reactions. And so, and they have different densities. And so it's important to a geochemist, but uh, to a, a normal human being, which a geochemist isn't, uh, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't make any difference. But so, so, so we have rock samples and we know that they're similar to the Earth's ones with, like I said, some important but small differences. And we also know just by, by making uh, laboratory measurements that if you start off with a bunch of oxygen and a bunch of iron and a bunch of magnesium and some aluminum and some oxygen and put them together, these are the kinds of things that they're going to want to combine into if you put the kinds of pressures and temperatures that we have in planets. And that's consistent. That's, you know, it, it, it's just like all other chemistry. If, if you put it in the same conditions, it's going to do the same thing every time. And so we're, we're, you know, 99 and a few nines confident that that's what's in there. We could be surprised. We weren't, su well, we were surprised, but not by that on, on the moon, for example. So, um, we have enough understanding based on what we've, we've learned from the moon, what we've learned from these meteorites that have come from Mars and from our laboratory measurements and our remote sensing measurements where we actually can, can look at the spectra, the reflection spectra of surface minerals on Mars and see the, the same you know, fingerprints that we see from the minerals on the Earth. So all that put together, we, we have a pretty good confidence that we have the, the basics of, of, of what Mars is made out of. And it's really the details that are important when you're trying to extrapolate back, you know, four and a half billion years. Yes. Hey, we'll take two more back here. Um, Mars is a third smaller than the Earth, uh, so how's the difference in gravity influencing uh, the, the propagation of the seismic waves at the surface or inside the planet, and how does that influence your results in general? Um, since Mars is smaller, uh, for one thing, seismic waves in general get there sooner so you know if you're halfway if, if you're halfway around the earth um, it's going to take a fairly long wait time to get there and as and as the seismic waves are going through the earth they're getting smaller and smaller they're getting absorbed partially so it's just like you know if a light bulb's farther away it gets dimmer and dimmer to your eye if a quake is farther away it gets dimmer and dimmer to the seismometer and so if you have a smaller planet you can essentially illuminate it with the smaller quake and so we, we're on, whereas on the Earth, you really need quakes that are kind of magnitude five and a half to six or bigger to be able to uh, produce waves that are strong enough to penetrate deeply into the Earth and come back out again so you can see them uh, from a long ways away. Whereas on Mars, we can probably do that, the same work with about a magnitude and a half to two magnitudes smaller quake. And so, which is a good thing because it's a smaller planet has less activity, and so we're not going to get as many big quakes on Mars as we get on the Earth. Fortunately, we don't need them because we can, we can work with smaller quakes. They don't get absorbed as, 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 as much because they don't have to go as far. That's the main thing. Also, um, pressure affects seismic waves, and since Mars is smaller, you never quite get up to the higher pressures that we have on the Earth. On the Earth, um, that affects the attenuation also. And so there, 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 there are some details, but the, the, the main thing is because it's a smaller planet, we can, we can work with smaller quakes. Um, I was wondering if a meteor or something were to hit Mars, how will that affect the Earth or will it affect the Earth? I mean, like if it were to destroy Mars? Um, well, it would have to be a really big meteor to make those kinds of, uh, of effects. Um, most of the meteorites that's, that strike Mars are, you know, rocks that are, you know, anywhere from this big to, you know, maybe, maybe this big um, for something the size, it would take something the size of, you know, like, you know, Vesta or Ceres to actually do some big damage. Even that would 
w it would you know probably destroy all the features that we see on on the surface but essentially all the stuff would would fall back and you just have a little bit bigger mars and so uh it wouldn't affect the earth at all i believe you, we might get a few extra meteorites but that might not even be noticeable why does um, mars not have a the protection of a magnetic field that's a great question. That's actually one of the fundamental things that, that we hope to be able to contribute to. Um, the generation of a magnetic field in the core of a planet is actually a, a really complicated thing, and it has to do with uh, interaction between the rotation of the planet and the, the loss of heat from the core. So as, as the core is cooling, um, the way that heat comes out, if you have a, 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 a liquid, it actually starts convecting, and that makes you know, motions this way, and that gets combined with the rotation to sort of make these things all into these little curls that all line up with the, with the uh, rotation axis, and then you can start up this, uh, this magnetic dynamo. So you have to have a, 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 a very specific set of rotation and uh, cooling rate of, of the core. Now, so if the core is solid, first of all, it's not going to happen. We have evidence that the, the outer part of the core of Mars probably isn't solid, so then we have to figure out, well, how fast is the Mars core uh, losing heat to the mantle and ultimately to the rest of the planet? And we think that it's just not losing enough heat quickly enough to set up these kinds of convection cells. But why that is, is it because of the, the, the viscosity, which has to do with the comp composition? Is it because it's too cold and therefore uh, most of the core is already solidified? Is it because it's actually too hot because... Mars's mantle isn't maybe not convecting, and so the top of the core is too hot and the heat can't get out because it's already hot, and maybe it's actually too hot instead of too cold. Those, those are the things that we're trying to figure out, and, and I think with the, when we get the, the, the density of the core and we get this, this uh, heat flow boundary condition, we'll be able to say a lot about the evolution of the core and be able to talk about, you know, when the dynamo occurred, when it shut down, and some things like that, which are, again, fundamental to the uh, retention of the atmosphere and some things like that. So I think we probably have to, to wrap it up. I'll be out at, uh, of circulating around in the uh, reception and be happy to answer uh, uh, other questions that you might have. So. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time.